All right, we're going to be talking about the Protestant Reformation of 1517. Well, that's when it, the big one began. Um, and the main one started with a gentleman by the name of Martin Luther. I want to talk about it a little bit and kind of do like an expository of, of the flaws and failures of this Reformation and, and how unbiblical it is and how Antichrist, bottom line up front, how Antichrist Martin Luther was. Uh, Martin Luther was absolutely, positively not a child of God. And I have much proof of that. Now, Brother Sam has preached a message on the Protestant Reformation. Um, he's got some messages on the beginning of Catholicism and things like that. I was able to listen to those some this week just to kind of get a refresher course. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about some other aspects of the Reformation um, and a little bit about Luther's personal life that we can determine and we can see that this man had not the Spirit of Christ, though he claimed it. And people today, and mainly, and when I say Baptist, I'm talking about denominational Baptist. I'm not talking about Baptist in doctrine. People today, they claim to be Baptists, they claim to be lovers of the truth and sound in faith and historic Baptists. Many folks today will uh, exalt Martin Luther as one of these great patriarchs of the faith. And if you do any little bit of research, just a little bit, it don't take very much. And as a matter of fact, you can go straight to Luther's 95 Theses. You go straight to those 95 Theses, you begin to read what he had to say You'll figure out real quick, if you have any little bit of discernment, just a little bit, you don't, it don't take much, and you understand a little bit of the Scriptures and what salvation is, you'll find out very quickly this man had an Antichrist doctrine that he believed and he wanted the Catholic Church to be reformed to. So uh, it's, it's really a mess that we're in today. Most people today that say they're Christian have absolutely zero discernment. It's very frightening. Uh, I think that a child of God should not be ignorant. I believe we should be well informed about the truth and about truth and error. We should understand the difference, okay? But Christendom today claims that the Protestant Reformation kickstarted our religious liberty from the Catholic Church and its dominance and religious control, okay? I don't believe that's true at all. I believe that the Catholic Church is basically apostated from the true church, which was Jesus Christ, okay? I don't believe that we came from the Catholic Church at all. All right, We didn't come from the Catholic Church, so you can't reform something that didn't come from the Lord. You are either in Christ's church and in His doctrine, or you're not. It's bottom line up front. The fact that the Reformation is claimed to be this great movement toward Christianity and a great reform for Christians all over the world to, to uphold the true doctrine is completely nonsense. Um, so a lot of folks today will believe that the Catholic Church is where our faith began, and that's a total lie. Listen, folks, the Catholic Church is nothing more than paganism and religion, Christianity coming together. That's all it is. When we have Christmas coming up in about two months, you'll notice very quickly that the Catholic Church always celebrates the same stuff that so-called Baptists celebrate. When we go, I've been to a Baptist church uh, over in... Georgia and several of them, where the the preaching is totally against Christmas traditions and totally against Easter traditions. Well, you shouldn't exalt the bunny rabbit. You shouldn't exalt Santa Claus. You know, we don't do those things. It's all about Jesus. That's what they. That, well, that's the narrative. But as they're preaching. And they say it's not about the Christmas tree. Right behind them is this big, mega giant bale bush called a Christmas tree. And then they want people to believe that it's not about paganism. It's absolutely about paganism. And that was given credit to Constantine in 313 AD. He basically mingled uh, religion and, and uh, paganism together. And now we have what's called the Catholic Church. All right. The Catholic Church, when you look at it on Wikipedia, Catholic Church, they say, started with Jesus Christ. That's a lie. That's misinformation. All right? It's all over the Internet. They relate Jesus Christ and His ministry with His disciples to the Catholic Church. They give credence to uh, St. Peter as starting the church. That's a lie also. Jesus Christ started His church, and He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Today I want you to know that the church of Jesus Christ, the true church, the ones who held to Christ's doctrines, His principles, never ceased to exist, 
ever in history. Ever since he started it, which by the way, Christ started his church before the mention of the word church in Matthew 16. Just because the word church in Matthew 16 is there and that's the first mention in the New Testament does not mean that that's where the church started. It started when he started choosing his apostles. Amen. It was The church was built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. But a lot of people will give credit to this gentleman named Martin Luther, uh, who lived in the uh, 1500s, 14 and 1500s. Uh, now, this man basically protested what they call the selling of indulgences of the Catholic Church. Okay, uh, <clears throat> He never really came out and said that the Pope, that the Pope is anti-Christ. And we're going to read later on in these 95 Theses, which I have them printed off right here. I'm going to read a few of these, and you can just decide for yourself if this man was truly against the Catholic Church or if he still has his affections toward it. All right. So the 95 Theses was nailed to the door of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st, 1517. So this Thursday, that will be 502 years ago. Uh, understanding church history must begin with the Bible. Not Bible colleges, courses, or secular historians. Our scripture or our understanding of the scriptures must come from the scriptures. We can't trust on people like C.I. Schofield. We can't trust people like these other Protestants, like uh, John Calvin and Zwingli and these other guys that want to push these other doctrines. We have to go to what the Bible says. And so that's what we go to. That's where we get our foundational truths. All right. So these truths that I'm going to talk to you about today and kind of exposing Martin Luther and the Reformation, these things should be an easy pill to swallow. If you truly believe the Scriptures and you believe that Scriptures are right, then these things that I'm going to show you today should not be a hard pill to swallow. You should be able to accept these things uh, because these things are important for us to understand, especially when it comes in this modern era where people today claim that Christianity started with the Reformation. It did not. Christianity never started with the Catholic Church. No Protestant. It started with Jesus Christ. And it starts, the Christian faith begins at repentance and faith. And we've been talking about that. So if we can understand that the principles of the doctrine of Christ, as important as they are, we, if we understand those principles in Hebrews 6, everything else will be uh, able to be understood if we have the principles down. Okay? I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But the Bible says that there were false prophets and misinformation <coughs> running rampant okay, in many of the churches that, that the apostles were over and they were, they were preaching to in the, in the epistles. We find that especially over there in 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 1. I'm going to go there real quick. Peter's talking about this. And uh, this is actually not the uh, text that I want to go to today, but this is one of them that I want to show you here. Peter said that there would be false prophets among us. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter number 2, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And the Bible says here in verse 2, look at this, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And then we find over here in 1 Timothy, Paul's talking about the same thing. Over here in 1 Timothy chapter uh, number 4, he says here in verse number 1, Now the Spirit speaketh express, expressly, that in the latter time some shall, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Boy, if that don't talk about the Catholic Church, I don't know what verse does. Catholic Church teaches these things. They teach that priests should be abstinent from marriage. That's why we have over 400 cases several years ago that was exposed that the Catholic Church was, was, was causing a severe sexual abuse in their, in their monasteries. Um, that's why we find most of these priests, a lot of them are pedophiles. Um, they have little boys as their you know, little altar boys that they have, and they'll, they'll sexually abuse them. There's all kind of problems with this. The Bible never condemns marrying. In fact, the Bible says, a man that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. So these, these, these uh, 
you know, these doctrines that the Catholic Church teaches like baptismal regeneration, you know, babies that are sprinkled at, at birth uh, when they're at, shortly after they're born, that is absolute heresy. We don't accept those doctrines. The Bible never once indicates anywhere where babies should be sprinkled. These doctrines and, and, and doctrines like um, reverencing the relics, there's, there's doctrines that the Catholic Church, Church teaches, and this is actually what uh, Martin Luther was taught, that we should reverence the relics, the old uh, relics, the um, things that the Catholic Church would keep as like holy relics of bones and of dead people, of dead saints. That's all garbage. That is total garbage, all right? They also call upon familiar spirits with their enchantments. They also believe in transubstantiation, where the priest will hold up a, you know, a piece of bread, and they believe that that piece of bread, when they hold it, and they do the little voodoo stuff with it, they believe that they believe that, that literally becomes the actual body of Jesus Christ. And then the wine that they take, they believe that actually becomes the, the blood of Christ. That's nothing more than transubstantiation. That is heresy. We don't believe that at all. That's cannibalism. Okay, cannibalism. So those are heresies. Now, uh, the, the man of God that understands the truth of the Scriptures should understand these things. And if you have a man that has affections and his beliefs toward these doctrines, that should set up a trigger right in your mind right away. Whoa, why are you... Why are you affectionate? Why are you reverencing the Pope? Why do you call him uh, the authority of God and these things? Well, we're going to find right here in some of these things that Martin Luther believed this stuff. He believed a lot of these doctrines. All right? So, the Bible says there will be false prophets. God wants His saints to be enabled to discern both good and evil. Evil. We, have, we find over here in Hebrews chapter number 5, in verse number 14, the Bible says, well, I'll go here in verse 13. The Bible says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, but he is, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. Uh, full age. And the Bible says, Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know why most folks can't understand between holy and profane, good and evil? is it's probably because they have a lack of discernment. And the reason they may have a lack of discernment is because they're, they haven't been able to really chew on the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. They may not have the doctrines of Christ, or they may be babes. So that's why God has sent preachers. That's why God's given us a pastor to teach us these things. Amen? And I want you to know today that it's a very good thing that God has done that because I need a pastor to teach me. There's things in my life, now let me tell you this, all right, in the offset. I, I, can't, I can't tell you how many times that I have looked to other doctrines and wondered, well, is that truth? Is that right? Can we, can we put trust and confidence in that doctrine and what that person has believed or what this person thinks or whatever? Well, when God gives you an ordained man to preach to you, God's done that so that you won't be carried about with every wind of doctrine. That's the problem we have today with, and I'm going to hit it again, I like to hit it a lot. That's what we get today with internet preachers, internet people that just love to live on the internet in their universal, invisible church, and they go and pick whatever doctrines they want to listen to, whatever preacher they want to listen to, and they get all kind of mixed information because they don't have a man that God has ordained in his local church to teach and to preach these things. So they get confusion, and then they get misinformation, and they get false doctrine, and they get heresies, and they start believing all kind of misinformation. And now what you have is a man that's totally confused and carried about with every wind of doctrine, and they don't know what they believe. And that's why God's given us a pastor. Amen. Amen. So we must be able to discern both good and evil. Now Martin Luther's testimony is a very interesting one. And actually, I think it sounds very similar to what we hear today in most fundamental Baptist churches. If you've never heard of Martin Luther's testimony, first of all, he doesn't have one. Not one that's biblical. But I will share with you, there is a testimony that he has <coughs> that has been recorded. Uh, and I've checked a few sources on this. I didn't check, check just one. I tried to check a few sources. Uh, but it has on record that he, at 21 years of age... Uh, Luther encountered a severe thunderstorm during his 90-kilometer trip back from Erfurt from Mansfield from visiting his family. So he goes to Mansfield and visits his family, and he's going back to Erfurt, where he's from. And according to the records, he encountered a very severe thunderstorm. Now, this is, this is other people's testimony of him, and I believe he has the same testimony Martin Luther does. 
When he encountered the severe thunderstorm, he had to try to find a way to escape it and, and hide somewhere. I think he hid under a rock or something. And the account says that there was a lightning strike that struck close to him, and he was seeing all of this horrible storm around him, and he started getting scared for his life. So what does he do? Well, according to some of these accounts, several of them, they all say that he said, Help me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk. St. Anne was the patron and the saint of miners. Now, his dad, Hans Luther, was uh, an entrepreneur in the mining business. He had a business mining, and in those days, that was a very lucrative business. Now, Hans... uh, would have this saint called Saint Anne, and apparently this is whoever the Saint Anne is. He was he would teach Martin Luther, his son, to call upon Saint Anne. And apparently, when Martin Luther was encountering all this storm, he cried out to Saint Anne. He didn't cry out to Christ. He didn't cry out to God. He cried out to Saint Anne. And so after this thunderstorm, he decided to dedicate his life to being a monk in the Catholic Church. That's Martin Luther's testimony. Okay? Now, he doesn't have a testimony of repentance and faith. Now, he does talk a lot about repenting of sin. But let me tell you today, there's people that have that same testimony that they were saved out of something. I was in the hospital and I just called upon God and said, God, if you'll do this for me, then I'll and help me heal. I'll get out of this hospital and I'll serve you. That's rededicating your life. Okay? That's vowing a vow to God that you won't be able to keep. That's not scriptural. Okay, people have that same testimony today of I went through a circumstance and I got out of it because God rescued me because I made a deal with him, a quid pro quo. It doesn't work like that. And we know that's unscriptural. It's always by repentance toward God and faith toward Christ. So we see Martin Luther had probably an encounter with death and he got scared and he decided to dedicate his life to being a monk. So he was a monk. And we find that in, uh, in much of the history that we can find on the internet and in books. But I want to ask you, is this a scriptural testimony of salvation? Okay. Now, another thing I want to point out, all doctrine and faith must be based upon a firm foundation. All right. If you don't base your faith and your practice on a firm foundation of Jesus Christ and what the Scriptures say, any other foundation that you try to lay is going to falter and it's going to fumble. All right. Our foundation must come from the Bible's account of truth. The Bible says, Psalms 11, verse 3, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We must have a firm foundation upon what the Bible says is salvation and not what man says salvation is and what the Catholic Church teaches. The church that Jesus built began before Pentecost, before the first mention of the word church. We find that in Matthew 16, 18. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And this same church was built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 18. For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit." And then 1 Corinthians 3 says in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if you're, if you're basing the foundation of your salvation upon an experience that you had and you got yourself going in the right direction with your life with God and it's not based on repentance and faith that we find in Hebrews 6, it is a faulty foundation and it will fall. And it will show itself too, by the way. So I'm going to go over there in Matthew chapter number 7. This is our text verse for today. Matthew chapter number 7. <clears throat> verse number 15. We'll begin here and we'll go through verse number 20. The Bible says very clear, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree... Now listen to this. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. 
but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, Jesus says, by their fruits ye shall know them. I believe when we look at the life of Martin Luther and how so-called great this man was for the faith, we'll find very clearly that this man did not bring forth good fruit because he did not have root in himself because his root was built upon heresies. His root was built within the Catholic Church. And he didn't have repentance and faith. He was a lost man, I believe. And unless he repented and trusted Christ as his Savior and was born again, the man is in hell today. So I want to look at <clears throat> this conclusion of what I've been talking about just briefly. If our foundation be upon the Scriptures, all theology and authorities can be discerned to be truth or heresy. So if we understand what the Bible says the salvation is and what the church is, we'll begin to look at everything around us and we'll be able to discern, well, that's right, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's right. We'll be able to see it because we have the Scriptures. Amen. All right, so let's look at these 95 theses. I want to read a few of them here. I picked out a few. These are some highlights. I always like going to the source here because people say, well, Martin Luther was such a great man. He went out against the Catholic Church. Amen. You know, he was a rebel and he hated what the church taught. And he was, he was very brave to nail the theses up on the door of Winburg there. And he made sure all, all the people knew on that All Saints Church that he was opposed to the Pope and the Catholic Church. All right, well, let's go look here and see what the 95 Thesis had to say. And I only have a few of these. I, man, I, I went through all 95 of them. I read all 95, well, with the exception of a couple. But, man, I'm telling you, I, you could rip apart pretty much a good 85 to 90 percent of them. And most of it is, most, there are some verses that sound correct. But you have to read the context of what he's talking about because some of these uh, lines that he's talking about go together. There could be three theses that are together and then make one point. So you have to kind of read all of them together. Uh, but I want to point out a few here, and I want you to just kind of discern whether or not this is biblical or not. Now, this man, by the way, believed in... He believed, he says that he believed in faith alone, in Christ alone, without works. That's what Martin Luther says he believed, and that's what many people believe that he believed. He didn't believe, supposedly, that our faith should come from the Catholic Church. But listen to what he says here in the uh, 95 Theses. I'm going to go to, to uh, number 6, number 7, and number 38. Luther clearly believed a sinner's guilt could be remitted by God and the Pope and priest. And I'm going to read number 6 here. This is what Martin Luther had to say in his 95 Theses. Number 6. The Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been remitted by God or, to be sure, by remitting guilt in cases reserved to his judgment. If his right to grant remission in these cases were disregarded, the guilt would certainly remain unforgiven. Now, I'm going to go to number 7. Listen to this one. God remits guilt to no one unless at the same time He humbles him in all things and makes him submissive to the vicar, the priest. Now I'm going to go to number 38 because this <coughs> is very similar to what he's talking about here. Number 38. Martin Luther says this, Nevertheless, papal remission and blessing are by no means to be disregarded. For they are, as I have said, Thesis 6, the proclamation of the divine remission. He believes that the priest has the divine remission power to forgive sin and to remove guilt. With accompanied by God, of course. But you understand the point that he's making here. All right, so let's go to another one. Number 9. Number 9. Martin Luther has this to say. <clears throat> in his 95 Theses, Therefore the Holy Spirit, through the Pope, is kind to us insofar as the Pope, is his decrees always makes exception of the article of death and of necessity. So he believes that the Catholic Pope, 
which believes in work salvation, believes that you must be born again at sprinkling as a baby, believes that you have to take of the true body and blood of Christ at transubstantiation. He believes this man possesses the Holy Spirit. All right, let's continue on. Number 16 through 19. Martin Luther says this about hell and purgatory in heaven. Hell, purgatory, and heaven seem to differ the same as despair, fear, and assurance of salvation. Number 17 says, It seems as though for the souls in purgatory, fears should necessarily decrease and love increase. Martin Luther believed in purgatory. Purgatory is a place where sinners go to pay for their sins until they're basically prayed out of purgatory or they have an indulgence paid for them on their behalf to receive eternal life in heaven after they die. All right, that's what purgatory basically is. Number 22, Luther believed sin's penalty must be paid by the sinner in his life before purgatory. I'm going to go to number 22, what he says here. This is what Martin Luther says. As a matter of fact, the Pope remits to souls in purgatory no penalty which, according to canon law, they should have paid in his life. All right, I'm going to continue on. Do I need to continue? I really don't. I could stop. and We could just stop right there. But we're going to continue on. Number 26, Luther believed the Pope makes intercession for the souls in purgatory. The Pope does very well when he grants remission to souls in purgatory. Not by the power of the keys, which he does not have, but by way of intercession for them. So he believes that the Pope is the middleman between us and God that makes intercession for souls that are in purgatory. Who is the intercessor for us? Christ. It's Christ Jesus. Amen. It is Christ alone. Now, we'll go to number 27. He says this, They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the mon money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. Now, this is his little bit of difference. He, he Basically, Martin Luther rejected the fact that you could sell indulgences, okay? Indulgences were basically, uh, it was basically a thing that you could use to pay away a sinner out of purgatory and get them into eternal life. It was something that you could use that was given to you by the Pope. And the Pope, what, what Martin Luther didn't like was that the Pope and the Catholic Church began to sell these indulgences as a way for people to be able to buy, buy their loved ones out of purgatory, all right? Of course, we find that all through the Scriptures, don't we? <laughs> that's, that's very evident in Scripture that we use indulgences to buy our loved ones out of purgatory. Uh, but no, in, in uh, number 27 and 28, he says here in number 28, It is certain that when money clinks in the money chest, greed and avarice uh, can be increased. But when the church intercedes, the result is in the hands of God alone. Number 40. This one's an interesting one. Martin Luther says this, A Christian who is truly contrite seeks and loves to pay penalties for his sins. All right, right away, who paid the penalty for our sin? Jesus, Jesus Christ. When did He do that? On the cross 2,000 years ago. He did that. Nobody else could do that. That was the whole reason that Christ was so good and the message is so wonderful is that Christ did that for us. He was the only one that could pay for our sin and penalty. And He did that on the cross when He said, It is finished. Right. No more sin can be atoned thereafter. It is through Christ alone and through His shed blood. But Martin Luther believes that sinners pay for their penalties. All right. And some of these penalties can be paid through things like penance. You know, you have to afflict yourself. You have to feel extreme guilt. You have to do things in order to receive forgiveness of sin. You have to make yourself feel like that you've, you've done so much wrong to God. And you have to have this inward turmoil and you have to afflict yourself and torment yourself in order to pay for your sins here on this life or else you won't, you, you won't go past purgatory. You'll go to purgatory until your sins are completely penalized and forgiven and then you can go to heaven. It's all part of the Reformation, and that's what he's talking about here in this 95 Theses. What he's trying to do is he's trying to reform a pile of poop. That's what he's doing. 
And I'm going to be frank in saying that because that's what the Catholic Church is. The Catholic Church is not the truth. It is a pile of dung is what it is. So what what we try to figure out is, well, what do we need to do to reform the church to make it back to where Christ uh, is, is head over and where he has preeminence and where we can get the truth back in. We've got to reform it. We've got to do something better. You can't reform a pile of dung. If I go out to the backyard here and I get Clyde's pile of dung and I try to bake it and I try to put fragrance on it and I try to do things and take out all the bad things, it's still going to be a pile of dung. It's plain and simple. Amen. All right? We can't reform things that have no root in Christ. The Catholic Church never had a root in Christ. They were always apostate. They were the Pharisees. Okay? They started their own tradition. They followed their traditions. Okay? Next, number 71 and 72. Let's continue on. Number 71 and 72. Let's see what Martin Luther says here. Martin Luther says this, Let him who speaks against the truth concerning papal indulgences be anathema and accursed. And then he says here in number 72, But let him who guards against the lust and license of the indulgence preachers be blessed. So you're basically cursed if you don't believe in basically papal authority and the indulgences. You're anathema. You're cursed when the Lord comes. You're cursed. Okay, so he's affectioned. Looks like pretty well to the Catholic Church still. Number 81. i got a couple more and we're done with this. This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult even for learned men to rescue the reverence which is due the Pope from slander or from the shrewd questions of the laity. You know what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is? That's where our word laity comes from, Nicolaitans. That's what the Catholic Church is. It's a hierarchy of Nicolaitans. There is a separation between the Pope and the priest and basically just the members of the universal church. By the way, you know that Catholic means universal. These people that want to claim that the church is universal are claiming a Catholic doctrine. Don't call yourself Baptist and don't call yourself a lover of the truth and a defender of the faith when you're going to consider the church that Jesus Christ started universal. That's the very meaning of the word Catholic. It's universal. Let's go to number 94, and we're done with the 95 Theses. 94, Martin Luther says this, Christians should be exhorted to be diligent in following Christ, their head, through penalties, death, and hell. All right, I think I've pretty much butchered that one. I think that's enough for us to see as the Church of Jesus Christ here at Old Paz Baptist Church that Martin Luther had some problems still. All right? <clears throat> now, Luther also had a very sincere hatred for biblical Christians. Okay, I'm going to go here. I picked this article out, and it's got some very interesting things talking about. And I really don't have a lot of time to go through this, and I actually printed this off so some of y'all can read this. But a lot of what Martin Luther believed was had... Uh, he believed that you should be penalized and punished and even put to death for things like sedition, which is basically uh, rebelling against uh, government authority. Okay, That's what sedition is. Now, I do believe that Romans 13 is there for us to understand that we should honor our local authorities. Okay, We shouldn't be uh, completely lawless. But there is a wrong authority and there is a right authority. If, I, if my rights are violated or if, I, if they do something wrong to me and they tell me I have to get abortion, I have to get a, a vaccine or something that is against my conscience, I can resist that. That's not proper authority. They don't have, the government should not have authority over my family and what I do to worship God. Okay, that's basically, the, that's basically what, uh, what we believe as Christians and what the Waldensians believe, the Donatists, these people believed in soul liberty of the believer. Okay, But when you have a guy like Martin Luther that believes, and in those days, they had the Catholic Church was basically the law of the land. What they believed and what they taught was the law. And if you go against that, then you're going against basically dominionist theology, which is basically church rules the law of the land. Okay? We don't believe that here. That's why we fled. We fled the, the European uh, persecutions, and we came over here to seek religious freedom. That's why we're here. And now our freedoms are still under attack. 
But that's why we have to understand that God has sole authority over the man and the woman. We should not let governments tell what the soul should do in their, uh, in, 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 in their worship with God. We should let God do that through the Scriptures. But Martin Luther didn't think so. Martin Luther believed that if you blaspheme the Pope, you blaspheme the church, and then you, you resisted the doctrines and the, and the things in the Old Testament, which, by the way, uh, I was reading where Martin Luther believed that there's uh, principles in the Old Testament where people should be stoned. He believed that we should still be doing that today in modern era. See, he, he had dominionist theology, I believe, and that's what he's talking about here in this article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. And I was going to highlight one specific point. Um, It says right here, in 1530, Luther advanced the view that two offenses should be penalized even with death, namely sedition and blasphemy. The emphasis was thus shifted from incorrect belief to its public manifestation by word and deed. This was, however, no great gain for liberty, because Martin Luther construed mere abstention, abstention excuse me, from public office and military service as sedition and a rejection of an article of the Apostles' Creed as blasphemy. So basically, if you reject the Pope's authority, that's sedition. If you reject any authority over you that's, that's really uh, intruding to your walk with the Lord and how you want to believe religious freedom, then that's blasphemy and that's sedition. And you should be penalized for that. That's what Martin Luther believed. But anyway, I got a whole article if y'all want to read that. I don't have this time to read all that because we're getting a little late here on time, but I'm going to try to hurry up with this. Now, another thing is Luther's indulgence and affair and affection with German beer. It's one thing I've never heard people talk about. Martin Luther was an avid German beer drinker, just like a good Protestant that he was. I got an article here, it's very interesting, and I got some quotes that Martin Luther said himself about German beer. Now, when he was in uh, Wittenberg, he went to college <coughs> uh, at a school of theology there, and as part of their curriculum and a part, as part of their way of life in this college, he would go to college and he, they would have mass at 4 a.m. in the morning, very strict, um, and then they would have two small meals a day. But with those meals, they were given, I think it was a pint of beer at every meal. And he loved that. He became indulgent with the love affection with beer. Uh, Y'all know what hops is. Hops is basically a a weed that grows, um, and they now use it a lot, I believe, in a lot of the uh, uh, alcoholic industry. They use hops as part of and a form of uh, their ingredient for making beer. You can give credit to the invention of hops beer to Martin Luther. Did you know that? Martin Luther was the one that led the way in that research, and he developed that. And that was part of his rebellion against the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church also believed in drinking beer. They didn't have a problem with it, naturally. But as his uh, defiance against the Catholic Church, he decided he was going to go out and get some hops out of the, you know, out of the you know, weed garden or whatever, because that was what uh, was not taxed at the time. See, the Catholic Church... And the governments in Rome back in those days, they had a heavy taxing on beer and alcohol. Well, they used a lot of the herbs and things like that, and they were able to tax those things. But when Martin Luther found out this new recipe, they couldn't tax it because it was basically just a weed that was not even going to be able to be profitable. But he used it, and it became very popular. We can give that credit to Martin Luther. Listen to this. Martin Luther and his beer indulgences, this is what he had to say. Now, this is, uh, there's some of these are quotes, so I'm going to go through them. This is by a man named William Boswick. He's the author of The Brewer's Tale. This is what he has to say about Martin Luther. Luther might blanch a bit as a good Protestant at being called a saint. In the interest of Protestantism, I wouldn't call him a saint. But he was certainly a beer enthusiast. And many a beer bar and brewery today has a picture of Martin Luther on their wall. Now, this is... This is probably an unregenerate man saying this, but this account is... There's several accounts of this by different people. Listen to this. Martin Luther's love affair with German beer. (coughs) The day's labors passed. He would sit with his friends, talking about Martin Luther. He would sit with his friends and talk. Fueled by his wife's excellent beer, conversation would become general, discursive, and sometimes unbuttoned. I'd say so. You get a little tipsy, you start talking out of your out of your mind. You start saying things that are inconvenient and things that are wrong. 
It's because alcohol distorts the mind. By the way, people, when you, when you show them this, most people today that, that are Protestant, this is, not, this is a non-issue. Well, what's the big deal? This is not a big deal to most people today. If you're a Christian, this should be a very big deal. Okay? Not only was Martin Luther an avid drinker, but his wife started a brewery. I don't know if anybody knew that. Her name was uh, Katharina, and she started a brewery back in those days after they got married. Um, and he was an avid drinker. Over here, I want you to read, I, w- I want to read this here for you too. It says here, Protestant reformer Martin Luther and his beard indulgence letter to his wife, Katharina von Bora. All right, so this is Martin Luther's letter to his wife. Listen to what it, Martin said. Yesterday I drank something which did not agree with me so that I had to sing. If I don't drink well, I have to suffer. And yet I do like to do it. I said to myself, what good wine and beer ha- I have at home. And also, what a pretty lady, or should I say Lord, he called his wife Lord. You would do well to ship the whole cellar full of my wine and a bottle of your beer to me here as soon as you are able. Otherwise, I will not be able to return home because of the new beer. That's Luther's works, 50 and 81. That's Luther's account. Okay, that's, that's not some secular guy just saying stuff about Luther. That's what Luther said. That's a writing to his wife. Protestant reformer Martin Luther rejected God's preserved words. But here we assume, he says, that the word will remain with us always, although, in fact, it stays and endures but a short time before it is gone. If you do not accept it gratefully and reverently, you will soon be without it. And once the word is gone, the time will come when you would feign to be pious and to be saved. You will want to obtain God's grace, forgiveness of sin in heaven. But all will prove futile. You will not find grace, forgiveness of sin, life, and righteousness. All will be under condemnation, even your best works. That's Luther's works, 23, 262 through 263. He didn't believe in the preserved words of God at all. Okay. All right. So the last thing I want to point out is the other Reformation. This article is very interesting. I want to read a couple of highlights and then we'll be done. This is basically his test, uh, a gentleman's testimony of Martin Luther and his love affair with beer and alcohol and German beer. All right, Just a couple of things. I'm not going to read the whole thing. <coughs> it says here in this article, Another virtue in Hopp's favor was their sedative properties. The mystic Hildegard was right in saying Hopp's weighed down one's innards. Now this is what... Martin Luther wrote to his wife, I sleep six or seven hours running, and afterwards two or three. I am sure it is owing to the beer. Wrote Luther to his wife, Katharina, Katharina, excuse me, from the town of Turgau, renowned for its beer. This is Martin Luther, folks. This is the great Protestant. Luther would have relished his role in promoting hops. If anyone loved and appreciated good beer, it was this stout, sensual and gregarious monk. His letters oft, often mentioned beer, whether it was the delicious Torgau beer that he extolled as finer than wine or the nasty Dassault beer that made him long for Katharina's homebrew. Quote, I keep thinking what good wine and beer I have at home, as well as a beautiful wife, he wrote. You would do well to send me over all the cell of her wine and a bottle of thy beer. By the way, we just read that from another source. Days before he died, in February 1546, in one of his last letters to his wife, he praised Namburg beer for, his, for its laxative properties. And then he talks about how well his bowels began to move because of all the beer he was consuming over there. So this man, this man loved his beer. Over here, this is a, an account that his wife owned a brewery. <coughs> when, the, when the excommunicated Luther uh, married the runaway nun, Katharina von Bura, the town council gave the couple a barrel of excellent Enbeck beer. It was, fitting, it was a fitting gift. Beer was soon to assume an even more central role in Luther's life, thanks to his wife. Such a helpful wife he had. The intelligent, talented, and exceptionally competent Katharina not only bore six children and managed the Luther's large household with its endless stream of guests, but also planted a vegetable garden and, a fruit, and fruit trees, raised cows and pigs, had a fish pond, drove a wagon, and to her husband's undying delight, opened a brewery that produced thousands of pints of beer each year. 
Her initial shaky attempts produced a thin, weak brew, but she soon got the hang of it and learned exactly how much malt to add to suit her husband's taste. Luther was ecstatic. Lord Katie, he says, as he affectionately called her, had assured him a steady supply when, when Wittenberg's breweries ran dry. His article, you can read about his love affair with German beer. That's Martin Luther, ladies and gentlemen. That's just a little bit. Should we look to this man as a great Christian and a great, uh, wonderful man of the faith that really had a strong desire to rebel against the Catholic Church and its heresies? Can we, just by looking at his 95 theses and look at his testimony and then looking at his fruit of his love for beer and wine, can we see those things as even godly? Yes, sir. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but um, I was... I was delivered by the grace of God from the Reformed doctrine, the, the Reformation, and, and uh, Luther was this, growing up. He was a hero. He was he was a saint in in the Reformed Church, and I, and I I. I grew up with frustration because the name of our church was Christian Reformed. And I thought, what, why, why does a Christian need to be Reformed? And it was all about the Reformation and the, the hero Martin Luther. I, I'm so thankful to be delivered from that. And know the truth. Amen, brother. Folks, just do a little bit of research and try the spirits and just see whether they are not, whether or not they're of God. And we'll be able to discern, is this truth or is this not? Our Baptist heritage is very, very wet with blood and gore and torment. You'll never find an account where the Catholic Church actually, actually killed Martin Luther. He died, I think, of a uh, he had a, not an aneurysm, but he had a stroke. But they let him live. After 1517, when he nailed the 95 Theses, he lived several years after that. Now, they called him a heretic, and they excommunicated him from the church. But what about our Waldensian and Donatist brothers and sisters? What about our Baptists, Anabaptists, those that were rebaptized after they got saved from the Catholic Church, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? They were tortured and, and sawn asunder. They were killed. They were slaughtered. Why don't we have the testimony of the great Martin Luther? This great, and by the way, I learned about Martin Luther in high school. How am I learning about a man that's so dedicated to Jesus Christ in public school? Something's wrong with that. Yeah. The world, see, they are of the world, the Bible says, because the world heareth them. They're of the world, but we're not of the world, therefore the world hears us not. The world does not hear us. When we go out and preach the gospel, when we preach repentance from dead works and faith toward Christ, not of works at all, the world does not hear us, but the world hears them. The world hears the Catholic Church. The world hears the Pope. We don't hear the Pope. The Pope is Antichrist, and the Catholic Church is the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. We don't listen to her. We listen to our bishop and, 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 and uh, shepherd of our soul, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's who we reverence at all times. Don't put your confidence in man. The Bible says, Cursed is the man that puts confidence and trust in man and maketh flesh his arm over there in Jeremiah 17. Amen. So just a little bit of expository about Martin Luther. Amen. Right here at uh, uh, All Saints Day on October 31st. That great old reformer Martin Luther. We're going to celebrate him and his wonderful life of a Christian. Amen. No, not really. He was a very much of a heretic and he's probably in hell today because he believed everything that was antichrist and unscriptural. And he lived that way too. Amen. All right. Well, that's it. God bless you.